All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks. Uh, I'm Dave. I'm not Ann. Uh, the way this is going to work is that I'm going to do the first half of our talk, and then I'm going to hand off to my lovely wife to do the second half of the talk, because uh, we're a, an author team. Uh, I'm a geologist. She's a biologist. And we're going to be telling you about uh, the, the work that we've been doing over the last few years that is captured and summarized in these books. So you should be seeing that the... the um, uh, the covers of the, the books that Anne and I have been working on for the last 15 years or so, where we investigate the connections between soil health and human health, about how the way that we treat the land affects the way the land can treat us. Uh, and so I'm gonna, my job today is to give you sort of an overview that leads up to the What's Your Food Ate book, the most recent one in, in our series of books, that really is looking at connecting soil health and human health. If you want to connect with us outside the conference, feel free to check us out at our website or on Twitter that's up on the screen now. But let me get into trying to share with you the journey that Ann and I have been on, uh, investigating the connections that really led ultimately to us working a lot on the connections between soil health and human health. Why the health of the land is actually fairly intimately connected to the health of not only just whole human societies in terms of our ability to feed uh, the world, but also into our individual health in terms of what's actually in our food. I guess when we, and what we'll do is we'll walk you through the way that how our farming practices affect soil health, how the soil health affects the health of our crops and, and the botanical world in general, how those two factors, soil health and, and uh, the, the health of plants, in turn influence the health of our livestock, and how that all wraps up into influencing human health. So there's a lot of dots to connect, going from soil health all the way through to human health, but that's what Anne and I have been working on, and what we laid out in What's Your Food Ate, and that's what we'll try and give you the background for today for understanding those connections and the science behind them, because in the end, what you can really kind of conclude from the, the work we've put together and the, the work of many other people that we've uh, synthesized is that soil health is our health, that our health is intimately connected to the state of the land and its ability not just to feed us, but its ability to nourish us. So let me get started. My job in the first half of this is to go through how farming practices affect soil health and how soil health wraps up to influence um, uh, the health of uh, the botanical world, and will then pick up the baton for the second half of our talk and look at the connections on uh, with the botanical health, the health of our livestock, and what that all rolls up into what's in our food and how that can support our health or not, as the case unfortunately has been under the world of modern conventional farming. So let's talk about soil health for a little bit. Um, soil is something that can have health. Um, it's something that people argue about the actual definitions of, but there's two ways to look at soil degradation, which impairs soil health. And one is the physical loss of the soil itself, soil erosion, and the other is the loss of soil organic matter and the degradation of soil life, which turns out to be very central to the provisioning of our crops with the mineral elements and the and the phytochemicals, things that we'll go into in more detail on, in this talk, um, in as, as they get into our diet. So let me start here with the, with the UN's global map of soil degradation from a number of years back. It's painting with a fairly broad brush, but gives you the feel. There's a lot of red on that map. The, the best estimates that. Um, geologists have um, and agronomists have made globally is that we've degraded somewhere between a quarter and a third of the world's agricultural production capacity already through degrading this health of the land that we uh, uh, of agricultural land the land that we depend on to grow our food um, and I like to use this map to start because it paints the problem of soil degradation as truly a global problem as we'll show uh, through this talk and in our work in What's Your Food Ate, it also amounts to an individual problem for eaters when we're thinking about how our food was grown, literally what our food ate on its way to our tables, and the starting point for that is how we treat the land, the state of the land, and global soil degradation is a very real and global problem today. If you look at the UN's most recent report on the state of the soil globally from back in 2015, they reported that humanity, the global us, are losing about 0.3% of our global food production capacity each and every year to soil erosion and degradation. And you know, a very fundamental um, uh, requirement for survival is at provisioning of adequate calories, getting enough to eat. Uh, the quality of that food, what's in it, and what we choose to eat, we'll go further into that a little later, but when we look just at our ability to feed ourselves now, we're losing 0.3% a year to soil degradation and soil loss. That 0.3% doesn't sound like a lot in any given year, and it's not. 
But if it happens in every year, year after year, it can really add up. And at this pace, we're on track to lose another roughly quarter to a third of our ability to feed ourselves on this planet through continually continual degradation of soil health and soil fertility. That does not bode well for our ability to feed ourselves later on this century. So what's been one of the big uh, problems in terms of uh, maintaining the health and fertility of our agricultural lands? It turns out that the plow, that most iconic of agricultural implements, is actually has been a major factor in the degradation of soil, and particularly soil erosion in, in societies around the world, and has actually affected the course and fate of human societies. Uh, now, what is it about tillage, the act of plowing, that undermines soil health? It leads to erosion of the soil. Why? Because it leaves the ground bare and vulnerable to erosion by water or wind in the time right after you plow. A freshly plowed field that gets rained on with an intense rainfall is a field that's going to shed sediment. It'll, you'll lose soil, and it turns out at a pace that's difficult for nature to replace. Now, the start of this talk might be a little... Um, uh, a, a little on the, the downside in terms of a, a depressing message in terms of how much we have degraded land in the past through uh, through generations of, of over tillage in many parts of the world um, before even the world of modern um, agriculture contributed to the pace of decline. But that's what I wrote about in Dirt the Erosion of Civilizations, the nature of the problem uh, and the backstory of human societies about how Society after society has degraded the land that we uh, use to grow our food and how that has affected civilizations in the past. And I'm going to spare you all the detail of all the civilizations I wrote about in dirt, but I want to highlight uh, the one in particular here, that of classical Greece, because it so well illustrates the problem of, of how um, uh, frequent relying on relying on too frequent a tillage, uh, on plowing too often, can lead to wholesale loss of the soil off of a fairly broad landscape. So if we go to classical Greece and look at soil, we can document in the archaeological record that cycles of so erosion and soil formation in ancient Greece began back in the Bronze Age, the, the, the thousands of years before BC, uh, right after the introduction of plow-based agriculture. So when plows arrived from sources further to the east in the Greek peninsula, the, the landscape looked about like this. This is a cross-section from Tier, Tier Van Andel's and, and Chris Reynolds' work back in the 1980s looking at the state of the Greek landscape uh, at the end of the last ice age, at the dawn of the agricultural age. There was open oak woodland on the hills with a one to three foot thick soil on the hillsides and river sediments down in the valley bottoms. Well, guess where people started farming? Well, on the flat, well-watered, easily worked ground next to the big rivers. And as their population grew and spread up onto the hillsides, cultivation spread from the valley bottoms right on up the hills. And eventually, you know, there, there's uh, uh, fields from the valley bottoms uh, well up onto the hills. And that started the, the clock ticking, in effect, on the loss of soil because the um, tillage of the land and then the exposure of the soil to uh, erosion by water and by wind eventually stripped the soil off the hillsides, piled it up down in the valley bottoms, and you can still see in many parts of the Greek landscape these upland areas that are uh, stripped of, of fertile soil where it's very difficult now to grow things in places where there are archaeological evidence of, of uh, wheat harvests uh, back in the Bronze Age, um, and that soil basically ended up down in the valley bottoms. And if there's, we know one thing about uh, the nature of being able to feed people on a landscape, uh, it's that if you have soil in a and you pile it all up in one spot, you're not going to be able to feed as many people. It's the area that's covered with fertile soil that's actually very useful for agriculture. So what did this do to classical Greek society? This is the graph that really started me working on this problem of long-term uh, soil erosion effects, which led to the connections that Ann and I are working on now on the connections between soil health and human health. But this graph illustrates the connections on societal health. So this is a graph of population density of the southern Argolid, a, a particular region in southern Southern Greece, that um, archaeologists, again, Van Andels and Runnell, reconstructed the population density of this area from 6,000 BC up to about the present. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, there, the population rose into the Bronze Age, crashed into a Dark Age before the age of classical Greece. It rose again in the classical age, crashed again in the Dark Age before the modern age. There's been three cycles of civilizations on this landscape. And there's two interesting things about this graph. Uh, one is trivial, and that is, in my view, sort of why the amplitude of this, these cycles increased. Why there, we can support more people today in the modern age than in the classical age, and they can support more people than they did in the Bronze Age. 
And that answer is obviously technology. We have better technology today than we did in the Bronze Age. No mystery there. But what really intrigued me about this graph was, was not so much the amplitude of the signal going up with each civilization, but the periodicity. Why a thousand year, a couple thousand year run up and then a crash for a thousand years, another um, uh, peak of human population, then another crash for a thousand years or so, and then onto the modern age. There's not a lot of places on Earth where three agricultural civilizations have occupied the same topography at different points in time. And that periodicity, white societies would last a few thousand years um, uh, before uh, a crash into a dark age, uh, was something that really intrigued my imagination. Uh, and, and as you might expect, it connects to soil erosion. But in researching this, I was intrigued to find that I was not the first person to recognize this pattern. The classical Greek philosopher, philosopher Plato, for example, back in you know, the 4th century BC, noticed the erosion event that happened in the Bronze Age, that, the bronze, that led to the, the Dark Age right before the uh, time of classical Greece when Plato was writing, when he wrote, the rich soft soil has all run away, leaving the land nothing but skin and bone. But in those days the damage had not taken place, the hills had high crests, the rocky plain of Phellus was covered with rich soil, and the mountains were covered by thick woods, of which there are some traces today. He was recognizing and documenting the role that farming practices played in the erosion of soils off the Greek landscape, and he connected that to the land being able to support fewer people at a time when the Greeks wanted all the people they could recruit for their armies to, to keep the Persians out in the, the sort of early geopolitical conflicts. Uh, but what I was curious about was his observations about how certain river mouths, that uh, the mouths of, of valleys that were well farmed, were building out big sediment-rich deltas into the Mediterranean where the rivers that flowed out of the forest were, were flowing clear and clean out into, into, into the sea. He basically recognized the connection between how erosion affects farmland and that integrates up into affecting human populations on a landscape. Now we can fast forward now a couple thousand years to the modern age and we'll talk a little bit about my home state of, uh, of Washington here. Um, this is a slide of the Palouse. It's a winter wheat field in eastern Washington, and it illustrates quite well that the problem, the erosive problems associated with tillage, with plowing, uh, are not things that are just relegated to the deep past of ancient Greece and, or in many other societies. This slide really captures why a geologist like myself would look at a freshly plowed field and go, wow, that's a disaster waiting to happen if only it rains. All the little channels that you see on this, on this um, photograph now are channels that we call rills. You could erase them with a single pass of the plow, plow right over them. But what happens if they keep happening year after year, stripping little bits of soil, shuttling it downstream, downhill, and then eventually downstream on its way to the sea, and adding up year after year? What you can get is something like this. This is also in the Palouse region of Washington. It's in the... Um, uh, it's in the eastern part of Washington state, the dry part of the state, and this fence line up here in the upper right hand corner of the image is a fence that the farmer built uh, originally back in 1911 when the land surface was up here at this upper orange line. And the only thing that happened in this field is that to the left of this fence, uh, it was regularly plowed um, and farmed in that winter wheat uh, fallow rotation that was typical of the region for 50 years to 1961 when the photograph was taken. And the ground started this bit, little cliff developed around the edge of the field. Now, I haven't told you how high that cliff is, but this little black line running from where I'm sort of circling the cursor from down there to up there is a washed out uh, uh, increment of one foot on a survey rod that's uh, kind of weakly expressed in the negative, but is there. This is a five foot cliff that developed from 50 years of agricultural erosion, that's about a foot a decade, that's about an inch a year. There's nowhere on earth that soil forms that fast. And it illustrates the problem that can arise with the over-application of tillage, leaving the land bare and vulnerable to erosion, and that, that can play out over generations. This is half a century worth of erosion that left the side of the field standing five feet high above the rest of the field. Now, I hope you're sitting there thinking, well, well isn't this an extreme example? And yes, of course it is. I'm a professor. I like to find extreme examples to illustrate the points I'm making. So, you know, this is one corner of one field in one part of the country. Let's zoom out a little bit and look at how the problem of land degradation affected the entire um, Piedmont country, the hill country in the American Southeast, running from Virginia up here in the upper right-hand corner 
down to Alabama in the lower left-hand corner. And this gray noodle shows you uh, the, the, the Piedmont area and the amount of soil that has been eroded since the dawn of, of colonial agriculture in this region. And you notice as most of it is gray, some of it is black, so four to more than 10 inches of topsoil loss across this broad region about the size of the Roman heartland, another area that was historically uh, denuded by um, early farming practices. And this is actually a big deal. When you read the original uh, journals of the farmers and plantation owners that were first clearing this land and starting to farm it, um, there was six to 12 inches of rich black earth over the reddish subsoil. So the loss of four to 10 to more than 10 inches of topsoil, it's virtually stripping the topsoil off this entire region uh, within just a couple hundred years of, of farming practices that used methods and techniques not all that unlike what the Greeks and the Romans uh, used long before us in the North American colonies here. Um, so this um, problem of soil loss and soil degradation is even a global problem. As part of the research for dirt, I basically compiled all the erosion data I could find off of to, to illustrate how fast farms are eroding globally, worldwide, uh, using conventional con modern conventional techniques, um, tillage and, and modern ag agrochemistry in, a, in effect. And what I came up with is a global average of about a millimeter and a half a year of soil loss off of, mo of agricultural fields. It varies greatly, of course, depending on what farm you're on. You could find farms in that original map that I showed you with the red zones all around the world. In each of those red zones, you could find farms that are actually building soil but we're not quite there yet in the story. That's the optimistic second half of this talk. Um, and what a, if we look today at the average rate of topsoil loss globally, it's about a millimeter and a half a year. That means it takes only about 20 years or so to erode an inch of fertile topsoil. Uh, and most natural landscapes only have six to 12 inches of fertile soil, which means we can plow, literally plow through the ability of the land to support great harvests without supplemental agrochemistry, without chemical fertilizers. It only takes us decades to do that. Um, how fast does nature rebuild soils? That's the numbers down here at the bottom in blue. Fraction of a millimeter a year, 2% of a millimeter a year was the global average I came up with from the synthesis that I published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences back in 2007. At that pace, it takes you know or centuries to millennia to rebuild that inch of fertile soil that modern farming practices can shed off the landscape in just decades. Therein lies the problem with um, a key problem with maintaining agriculture uh, with the techniques we're using in modern agriculture. Fortunately, there's ways to, to, to fix this problem and get around it, um, but you don't have to take my word for the, the magnitude of the problem. There's a, a pair of papers by Evan Thaler and Isaac Larson and colleagues uh, from the UMass Amherst um, a couple years back that measured the average rate of historical erosion across the entire Midwestern U.S., the upper, the Corn Belt and the upper Midwest. They came up with a number similar to my global number, about on just shy of two millimeters a year. Uh, the shocking thing they also came up with is that the extent of soil loss across the U.S. Corn Belt means that about a third of all the areas that we're using to grow corn across the U.S. today have already lost their entire topsoil, their A-horizon in the parlance of soil scientists. <laughs>